Okay, you are watching Call for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois, April 16th, 2023, Sunday around 4.30 p.m. And we are starting a new game, a new play-by-mail serialized game today called Dear Holmes. This is quite unlike anything we've uh, done previously on the channel. And what we're going to do today, this is the first session. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Dear Holmes is. Maybe we'll look at the web page. And then we will open and read what I believe is an introductory letter welcoming me to the system. And then the first letter of the first case that we'll be playing. So what is Dear Holmes? Um, I'm not sure whether calling this a game, I mean, it is a game, but it's not like most of the games we play. There aren't going to be, there's no, there's no map and there are no actions. Basically, you sign up to this service and you get one letter each week, approximately. And those letters are broken up into cases, four letters per case. So basically you have a new case each month. I believe you're getting four letters that are like increasingly, um, increasing evidence about a mystery you're trying to solve. I believe you're gonna get letters that are saying, here's the case, can you help solve it? And then at the end of those four, Sherlock Holmes will send you his solution. These are all set in Victorian day. And the goal is to understand the mystery and solve the case before Sherlock Holmes explains it at the end of the month. There are a couple of things that are really unusual here. And let's go to the web page so I can show you them. Um, okay, so here is the Dear Holmes website explaining how it works. Each month is a new mystery. Each week you get a letter as part of the mystery. And then here's where it starts to get interesting. Global competition optionally compete with detectives around the world for coveted title of featured detective. Um... So let's look at the FAQ because I want to show you what I find particularly interesting. So you can give this as a gift. You can give it to yourself. You'll get a letter each week. How challenging. This basically just says it's a variety. Some are easy. Some cases are easy. Some are hard. Outside research generally not required. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Look at this. Do your monthly mysteries repeat? No. So one of the selling points here is that unlike everything else, every other game of this sort that you would expect, this is sort of a live system. Every month they're creating a new case and it doesn't repeat. And this is sort of like watching broadcast TV. The idea is that everyone playing this game, everyone who signs up for this, gets the new case at the same time. No one has access to the solution until the end of the month. And people can write in their solutions and try to win each month's contest. Who writes these mysteries? Written by carefully selected group of modern Sherlock Holmes authors. So 
If you want, you can just try to solve it and then you get your answer at the end of the month. But you can also try to submit your solution to the case before the end of the month, before Holmes solves it. You can actually send them a letter. This, they're big into the whole this thematic thing of writing letters. So you can actually send them a physical letter or you can submit it online. Um, and then they make, they post the solutions at the end of the month. They will send it internationally. You have to pay a little more. Can you get, try your hand at some of the older mysteries? I believe they say you, you don't, you, but you can do, well, you can read one sample podcast, but then there's this other thing where they narrate podcasts of the I'm not sure if they're, I know they narrate it. I think the idea is that you can listen to the letters read by a professional reader each week instead of reading it. And they have a little sample. Let's see. Practice cases aren't available. Private podcast feed. Okay, so if you pay, you get access to the podcast fee, which has each, all of the letters narrated, I suppose. Okay, so, and then did we look at how you solve it? Where does it say? Okay, you by telegram. Okay, you can go here. So let's just take a look at this. Okay, share your solution to this month's mystery for your chance to be next month's featured detective. So you can send them a letter or you can submit your solution here. You just explain it. They've evidently got humans reading these solutions. Somewhere it says, look, you can upload a photo of yourself in case they use it. And then, so here are previous people who have solved it. Okay, let's look at this. How do I maximize my chances of winning each month? Get the details right. More than simply figuring out who did it, identify how the crime was done, why people behaved as they did, write well, write Sherlock a letter, lay out your case. So we're cars, we're not Sherlock Holmes, we're trying to solve it, he's going to solve it, so we're, right, they want you to write the letter as if you're talking to Sherlock Holmes and explaining it, cite evidence, if you send a physical letter you get bonus points. Can I submit more than one entry? Sure, you, it says, yes, you can. If your theory of the case changes after your first submission, you're more than welcome. So I guess the idea is to be the first person to send the best solution. The longer, the more letters it takes you, the longer it takes you to solve it, the less chance you will to win this prize. Okay, so it's fascinating. It's fascinating that the mysteries don't repeat that they're actually writing new mysteries every month so that it's live. Everyone is seeing it at the same time. That's fascinating. It's fascinating that they've got humans reading the solutions. Sounds crazy. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Um, I suppose you might be curious about the pricing. Let's see, let's take a look at this together. Okay, so, you can have a little trial, six mysteries, which would be 20, uh, 24 letters. Okay, so five letters per mystery, four clues, and then Sherlock Holmes solves it on the fifth letter. Okay, so there you have it. Six months, 30 letters, $100, or 12 months, one letter per week for a year. Okay, I signed up for this one or this one. I can't remember. But, so here's my plan. My plan is that we will have these weekly sessions. Assuming the letter arrives in time, we're going to finish our play-by-mail birder, find a birder case, and then we'll just put these, slot these into our Sunday sessions instead of the blinded birder. We'll play this. We'll just read the letter. I don't know. We'll talk about it for a while. Then you guys can chew on it. 
If you come up with solutions ahead of time, you are welcome to submit them to the website. I don't, I actually suspect it won't let you submit unless you're a, you've paid for your membership, but we can discuss it at the end of each week. And then if we want to submit something, our theory to the website and write it up, maybe someone can decide to write it up or we'll just play along and not submit it. But we'll see how it goes. Whether this is entertaining, interesting, don't know. If there are new cases every month, I suspect some may be better than others. Whether these letters are going to be things that you'll want to chew on for the entire week, like it could be a cipher code that you meant to work on multiple days. But we don't know. We'll see what it's like. All right. So here are the two letters that I've gotten. Whoops, let's do it this way. Two letters I've gotten. One of them is just going to be a generic welcome, probably talking about some of the things we've already talked about. And I sus and I think one of them is going to be the first letter of the first case of April. That says number one on it. So that's what my, I suspect that's our, going to be our case. So I suspect this is going to be the welcome letter. So let's read this together. If not, if it's the first case, then I'll open the other one. Okay, so it looks like we've got a bunch to read. Okay, so I was wrong. This looks like a case letter. It's actually, I thought it was going to be a letter. It's actually two double-sided sheets, so that's four pages to read. That's non-trivial. But that's what we're here for. So this might be the welcome letter. Yes, okay, so here's the welcome letter, just a single sheet. I'm thrilled to see these are typed rather than handwritten. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Let's read this together. 221B Baker Street, London, England, December 5, 1899. Ratio Vero. Dear Detective, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Dear Holmes and to your new career as a consulting detective. For the next several months, I will be relying on you to help me solve some of my most challenging cases. Every month, you'll take on new case, one new case. About once a week, you will receive a letter with the latest evidence from the client, one of my associates, or another involved party. After each letter, I will attempt to anticipate some of your questions and prompt my correspondence for answers. Each mystery will challenge you in different ways. Depending on the month, you may need to decode a cipher found in a gold mine, solve a puzzle hidden in a book, or parse through personalities to determine which of several suspicious individuals is responsible for a curious disappearance. How you go about solving each case is up to you. Some detectives solve the mystery piecemeal as each letter arrives. Others solve it all at once at the end. Some solve alone with a chalkboard and their favorite beverage, while others solve together with family or friends. You should, however, be aware of one inducement for you to solve with haste, the featured detective competition. After each mystery, I award a prize and public recognition to the correspondent who wrote me with the most creative, helpful, and timely solution. The prize can take the form of anything from a drinking vessel to an engraved nameplate. For your chance to win, mail your solution to the return address on your clue letters. And yes, you can write me more than once. I wish you luck in solving my cases. The game is afoot. Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective. P.S. I'm told by my associates to share the following cryptic message, which I haven't yet been able to decipher. If you ever need assistance with your membership, don't hesitate to reach out to our support team at dearholmes.com support or support at dearhomes.com. To learn more about the featured detective competition, visit Dear Homes. Oh, okay, so there we have it. The welcome letter on a nice, fancy, bonded stationery. 
1899. Okay, so that was our welcome letter. Everyone gets that when they sign up, gets the same thing. And then we have our first case of our first month. Okay, so four pages. Let's read it together. The Chalfont Estate, Chalfont St. James, Buckinghamshire, 20 June 1924. Che Sarah Sarah. Okay. Dear Mr. Holmes, I am the master of the hounds of Lord Chalfont. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. My main responsibility is to make sure his lordship's pack of hounds is kept in peak condition, though I also breed dogs, sell surplus dogs, and buy new dogs as the need arises. I have been told by a longtime acquaintance in the Dartmoor, in Dartmoor, that you are precisely the sort of person to approach with the problem I have recently met. The matter I want to raise with you may well be an isolated incident, in which case you will hear no more from me. But what has occurred undoubtedly earns the description of grotesque. I intend to be absolutely certain that it does not occur again, and for that, I hope you will lend your sharp mind. I am normally the first person of the household to be up, but yesterday morning I was disturbed by a furious barking just before my normal rising hour of five o'clock. At first I thought that a fox or squirrel was nearby. At worst, that it had imprudently leapt into the dog's enclosure and inspired them to compete for an unexpected meal. Then my mind turned to Lord Chalfont's collection, and I began to dress, dress swiftly as I could. He is a keen menagerist and has a small private zoo. Menagerist has a small private zoo. Peacocks, three ostriches, a raccoon, a bear, a crocodile, and a possum, among others. Plainly, he treats the exotic animals as his pets, and if one of them had got injured by one of the mere hounds, I would be the first, after the dogs, to bear the consequences. I ran the fifty yards from my quarters to the dog enclosure, but when I got there, I found that one of the dogs, Bundo, had been attacked. The dog had passed out of consciousness by the time I arrived, and there was an alarming amount of blood around a wound to his flank. The other dogs were very agitated, but none seemed to have been injured in any way. I wondered briefly if they might have attacked each other, but if that were the case, at least one of the other dogs would have been bloodied. This was not the case. And I saw no obvious signs of anything or anybody else, or any kind of weapon. I ran back to the servants' quarters to try and determine how best to help Bundo, and found that one of my assistants, Mr. Derry, was already up. He was preparing a light meal, as his shift was not due to start until lunchtime, as I explained the situation. He advised we lift the dog onto something firm, which would enable us to more easily put him onto a cart and take him to the nearest town. I agreed and suggested we fetch a large tray from the kitchen. On the way, we passed Lord Chalfont's valet, Mr. Bertram, who is taking his own mascot, a shrill fox terrier Perky, for an early morning walk. We briefly told him what had occurred, but I refrained from asking for his help as he would have surely brought the dog and further agitated my hunting dogs. Perky often teases them by yapping at them relentlessly outside their enclosure, as he knows they can't do anything more than bark back. Bertram gasped and picked up Perky after hearing the news. This is why you sleep in my room, Perks, he said, walking away. 
In the kitchen, we were able to find a more suitable helping hand, as well as the tray we sought. Monsieur Lefebvre, our head chef, was at his post. I've been up waiting for deliveries. They're late today, he told us, chewing on bread. Once we told him what happened, he produced a large salver and quickly came with us to help lift Bundo onto it and take him out of the enclosure. I then prepared a cart. We lifted the salver onto it with Lefebvre's, Lefebvre's help, and I drove to Chalfont St. James, which is just over a mile away. I knocked on the door of the vet. It was by now half past six, and a maid answered. We explained yet again Bundo's situation, after which she promised to get the vet up. Mr. Isaac Allison was swift to appear. He properly sedated Bundo and got to work at stitching up the wound. For nearly two hours, he was stooped over Bundo, first cleaning and dressing the wound, then putting in what seemed like hundreds of fine sutures. A lucky escape, he said at length. What happened? Did you find the knife? Couldn't have been a large one. I confess I was too stunned to respond at once, but Mr. Allison continued. It's a miracle it missed everything it did. Went past several important arteries and organs. He'll do all right now, although I should keep him here for a week at least. Have you ever seen anything like this before? I asked. When you've... Oh, well, when you've been at this job for as long as I have, nothing is new. He finished with a sigh. I have been here in Chalfont St. James the last twenty years, and before that I was in practice in a village in Staffordshire. There I found myself dealing with a series of attacks on livestock. I found the ordeal maddening, a bit repugnant, needless to say. I hope this is the last case of this type I see here. I asked him who would do something like that, and his response was somewhat concerning. I had gone from Staffordshire before the matter was resolved, but I heard it was an inmate who got out and gone hunting for dinner on someone's land. There are lots of establishment for the weak-minded there, just like here. Still, I beg of you, Mr. Bradley, do not involve me in speculations... As to who did this to your dog, I trust the police will be able to afford you assistance in that regard. I took Mr. Allison's comments with a grain of salt, most of all, because there have been no reports of any escaped inmates near the Chalfont estate. When I returned from Mr. Allison's, I told Derry to alert the police and went directly to the dog enclosure myself to inspect it with greater calm and see what I could make of the incident. To my chagrin, the house was up by the hour of our return, and Bertram had spread word of the attack on Bundo. There was thus a melee of humans and their associated footprints around the enclosure. I am ashamed for not looking for footprints or tracks earlier when I discovered Bundo, for there was an unsurprisingly... There was unsurprisingly no manner of telling which ones had been there before everyone had gathered. Thus ended my investigation until Derry arrived with two constables in tow. Their investigation and its results were no better than my own. Constable Nelson and Keedy assured me that they would call on us once they had any news concerning the incident, and that in the meantime we should be sure to keep the enclosures locked and under watch. I informed them of Mr. Allison's evaluation, but Constable Keedy was convinced that oh, a large fox or something probably got in. He wagged his finger towards the enclosure. They can be crafty and their bites can be nasty. The other constable nodded along to this and suggested we purchase a padlock. Although the estate's rare animals are kept behind locked gates, I have never felt the need to lock the dog enclosure. Hunting dogs can look after themselves and people scarcely have any reason to bother them. Of course, I agreed to purchase a strong lock for Lord Chalfont in any case, and it is 
After doing so and learning of something most bizarre, that I found myself driven to write to you. This morning, I went into Chalfont St. James and paid a visit to the blacksmith, Mr. Droy. I bought a, small, a strong padlock from him and requested a bolt which I could use to secure the entrance to the dog enclosure. I seem to be turning from a maker of horseshoes into a fashioner of security, said Droy. When I, when I asked him to explain himself, he said, well... Mr. Lewington was here last week, had me make a new bolt for one of his cages. You had a break-in, too. Mr. Lewington is the estate's zookeeper, Mr. Holmes, and this was the first I had heard of any sort of break-in. Without delay, I returned to the estate and spoke to Mr. Lewington, who blushed and confirmed what, Dr. what Mr. Droy had said. Uh, yeah, look, nobody broke in, and I don't want to upset Lord Chalfont by making a fuss about nothing. However, I did need a new lock for the bear's cage. It, it seems Grizzly has been trying to eat away at it. When I went to bring him food last Tuesday, I noticed metal filings on the ground. I questioned him. You don't think somebody was trying to file through the bolt? He laughed. <laughs> To steal a bear? No. Even if he's valuable, Grizzly can fend for himself, I'd think. We've got a new padlock now anyways. He showed me a massive piece of metal. And Dr. Droy has fashioned us a sturdy bolt, three inch in diameter. Enough for Grizzly's chewing habit. I trust. I, too, wish to avoid upsetting Lord Chalfont, but I'm less inclined to trust Mr. Lewington's theory and grow more worried by the minute that the estate's animals are in danger. In case it might help you to formulate a hypothesis, I've thought it best to provide additional details regarding where the dogs are kept and the estate at large. The Chalfont dogs are kept in kennels in a specially built enclosure. The entrance can be secured with a metal latch to ensure the dogs won't escape. Though, as mentioned, I have never thought it necessary to lock until now. The surrounding wire fences are more than six feet in height, and the estate itself is walled. The walls go on for miles. Access for outsiders is permitted through the manned gateposts, of which there are four, one on each of the property's corners. Suffice it to say that somebody could easily wander the property for some time before encountering another individual, but guards stand by each of the gateposts at all hours. Lord Chalfont is, as you are doubtless aware, one of the longest noble lineages in the country, and his wealth is commensurate with his status. The Chalfont estate is accordingly substantial. We joke that so long as one is employed on the estate, they have no reason to leave it. As well as vast gardens, the pack of hounds to which I have referred, and the zoological collection, there is an extensive kitchen, a somewhat renowned library, La Bibliothèque Chalfont, a blacksmith's, and a cricket pitch, each of which requires its own staff. Lord Chalfont also has varied business and political interests, for which he employs a personal secretary and a pool of typists. It will come as no surprise that he is the largest employer in the area. Indeed, posts here are eager, eagerly sought after. There are many staff with long years of service. I wish I could provide you with more substantial information, but in truth, I'm at a loss. I cannot figure where to start, and although I can imagine people who might wish ill upon Lord Chalfont, I can't imagine why anybody would launch an assault on his animals, especially Bundo or any of the dogs. Is there something to this that we are failing to perceive? Until we have heard from you or the constabulary, I have taken what I hope is the temporary additional measure of moving my quarters so that I sleep directly outside the dog enclosure. I do not propose to let such an act happen to my charges again. I will keep you informed of any developments, 
But if there is any other detail I might be able to provide, you need only ask. I hope to hear from you soon. Sincerely, Peter Bradley. So there you have it. A nice, big, long letter. Four pages, four sides. Nicely typewritten. Very period dialogue. Very compelling, interesting mystery. I don't know if all the letters will be so elaborate, but or if it's usually just the setup letter. And note that you're not meant to be able to solve it from the first letter, I guess, or at least as a rule. And certainly I don't think you might be able to make a guess at it, but there may be clues in here and we'll, on the, the next letter will give us an update on this. All right, did anything jump out at you here? I think probably we will mark these up as we go. We may need to reread them. We're not going to reread this, obviously, now, but I'm just going to go make some notes myself. So let's see. He hears barking just before 5 o'clock. Actually, before I reread this, let me just check in with the chat and hear thoughts, what you guys think. Does this sound interesting to continue playing these weekly? Um... Debbie says, interesting story. Nice to see one that isn't a murder for once. A couple of things strike me. The fact that the knife didn't hit vital organs suggests the attacker may have known what they were doing. Interesting. Okay, furious barking before 5 a.m. First he thinks, oh, they're barking because a squirrel got in. Then he realizes, wait a minute, maybe Lord Chalfont's ostriches or something are being attacked by the dogs. He doesn't want that to happen, so he runs out. 50 yards from his quarters to the dog enclosure. And he sees one of the dogs is passed out. Alarming amount of blood. A wound to his flank. Okay, so the dog is wounded in the rear. That's important. Obviously, the attacker did not confront the dog head on. Sounds like maybe he snuck up on him or whatever. None of the other dogs are bloodied, so that's what rules out another dog attacking him. He doesn't know exactly what's happened yet. He goes back to servants' quarters. He has an assistant, Mr. Derry, who's preparing a meal. He says, let's put the dog on a tray, carry him to the hospital. They run into someone else, Lord Chalfont's valet, Mr. Bertram, who's got a dog, Fox Terrier Perky. Seems genuinely surprised. Then they find another person in the kitchen. Monsieur Lefebvre, the chef, the chef, who gives them a tray. They go to the vet, half past six. The vet is Isaac Allison. He comes and cleans the wounds, and that's when he reveals it's a knife that injured him, which shocks our guy because he thought it might have been an animal attack. Now he turns out it's a knife attack. We ask him, has he ever seen anything like this? And he says, yes. Where he used to work in Staffordshire, there were attacks on livestock by a, a insane asylum guy. But he heard it was an inmate Gone out hunting. Okay. He gets back. They call the police. They go to look for footprints around the enclosure, but People have been walking all over the place 
since he was gone. So he says how he messed up. He should have studied. For, he should have looked for them originally. Now it's too late. The constables come, Nelson and Keedy. They don't believe, they don't pay any attention to the knife theory. He still thinks a fox got in. They suggest he purchase a padlock. He says, I'm going to go get a padlock. He goes to the blacksmith, Mr. Droy. He buys a padlock. He asks for a bolt to start securing the entrance to the hounds, which he no normally has doesn't do. And then the blacksmith said, hey, that's interesting. Everyone is doing this. He tells us about Mr. Lewingston last week had a new bolt made because of a break-in. So our guy, Peter Bradley, goes to Lewington, who's also Lewington, who's also on the estate. So I guess this other guy is also on the Chalmont estate. Chalfont estate. The guy didn't want to make a fuss about anything, so he didn't report it. He says, the bear, he said, let's see, I needed a new lock for the bear's enclosure. It seems the bear's been trying to eat away at it. He noticed metal filings on the ground. Our guy says, hey, maybe the bear wasn't chewing on it. Maybe someone was trying to file through. Um, I want to note something. Um, if the, if he thinks the bear was chewing on it, does that mean the bolt is on the inside? The bear's been trying to eat at it. Doesn't that doesn't that imply that the bolt that the bear had access to the bolt, so that the bolt was on the inside? Our guy thinks someone was trying to break in. Okay, then this guy says you're not going to break in to steal a bear. The bear's going to take care of itself. That would be dangerous. But he bought a new bolt. Okay, let's see what else. Additional details regarding where they're kept. He says, dogs are kept in kennels, entrance through a metal latch, but it's not locked. Then he says, the entire estate is surrounded by wire fences more than six feet. The entire estate is walled, so it's hard to get in and out. There's four gate posts at the corners, manned at all hours. Sounds like it would be hard to get on this property. There's a lot of people here, but it sounds like it would be hard for a non-worker to get on property. Got a library, cricket pitch, the animals. Kitchen, blacksmith, every the blacksmith and the other person are all on site. Business, he's got typists. And now he's going to sleep directly outside the dog enclosure to make sure it doesn't happen yet. Okay, well, that is a compelling mystery. Uh... Nothing hugely suspicious about that jumps out at me. The only weird thing is that is the bear enclosure. So it seems like we're all in agreement. Let's see. Dogs may have recognized the person, otherwise they would have attacked them, made more of a fuss. I like that idea. Bump says, for sure, someone inside this estate. 
So yeah, it does sound like it's an inside job. Rob says the YouTube chat filtered out a message from Debbie didn't show. Okay. So YouTube has a live chat top chat thing that sometimes blocks messages for odd reasons. Um, so what you don't see on the chat here, Debbie said, a couple of things strike me. Fact knife didn't hit vital organs, suggests attacker may have known what they were doing. Um, I just said it looked like an inside job. Yes, but why? So let's think about the why for a second. The, was it really a knife? The doctor thinks it's a knife, but it could be a sharp claw. It's possible the bear has figured out how to get out and has attacked the dogs. And that the shavings on the thing are the dogs. But that it doesn't that's not that doesn't work because the bears were attacked weeks ago. And the padlock was replaced with something even harder. So this seems like the bear is related to the dogs. Last week was the bear. Trying to eat away at it. When I went to bring him his food, I noticed last Tuesday, he noticed metal filings. Debbie says, Emmy says, animal rights type, trying to free an animal from the menagerie, anti-fox hunting. Debbie says, wonder if Lewington might also be making up the bear thing to cover for attacking the dogs himself. Why viciously knife a dog in the butt? That's the real question. Why would you knife a dog in the back. First of all, it can't be very easy to knife a dog in the back and not get attacked and not get attacked by the other hounds. Like, how do you even do that? Wouldn't the dogs notice someone coming in? So I wonder if it wasn't, I, I have my suspicions about it not being a knife. Bird beak? I don't think a, no, a bird beak can't, you can't, you can't, you can't cause a giant wound in a dog from a bird beak. But you could get one bear claw. Could swipe the dog. But what, how do you get a bear? And the bear would be big enough to scare the dogs away that he could get he could get hit as he's running away. If I had to guess, that would be my guess, that it's not a knife, that it's a bear. Debbie says, but you would have thought the vet could tell a claw from a knife wound. I mean, a bear's claw is very sharp and big, and a vet is not used to seeing bear attack. Right? So I, you could imagine that you could imagine that he got just caught by one of the claws instead of all four. Uh, and Tina says the dogs would have been barking if it was the bear. The dogs were barking. Don't forget, that's what woke him up at 5 a.m. Lots of barking from the dogs.
The thing that's troubling me is there's only one bear, and this guy is got the bear in a padlock from last week. So the question is, Grizzly can fend for himself. I've got a new, we've got a new padlock anyway. He showed me a massive piece of metal. And Dr. Mr. Droy has fashioned us a sturdy bolt, three inch in diameter. Enough for Grizzly's chewing habit, I trust. Someone have tried to set the dog on the bear. If I had to guess right now what was going on, my guess is that this bear was in was was adopted from a zoo. Like he's he's a like a pet bear, and he's like a bit of an escape artist bear, and he's figured out how to get out of his cage and attack the dog. That's my guess, and that it wasn't a knife. The other dogs were very agitated, but none seemed to have been injured in any way. They're very agitated. So the dogs are agitated. The only other possibility is that someone is letting the bear out into the dogs. Emmy says, so you're suggesting the padlock bolt was bought after something actually escaped from the collection and he's saying it's the bear trying to get out as cover? No, I'm saying the bear is the attacker. Debbie says, could someone have tried to set the dog on the bear or vice versa? This is Rob is saying the one thing that's 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 troubling me. The bear had a new lock last week. He shouldn't be able to get out and get back home and close the padlock. So the bear broke out of his cage, broke into the dog enclosure, attacked the dog, then left and locked himself back in the cage, smarter than the average bear. Yeah, so my, my thought is, I was thinking the bear let himself out, but now I'm thinking someone else is letting the bear out to attack the dogs for reasons unknown. All right, well, that's our first letter. Pretty compelling, um, but we'll have to wait a week to get our next letter to see if we can't get more evidence about what's happening. Does anyone else have want to go on the record with a theory before we end our first session here? Uh, perhaps we perhaps it is another one of the animals and it was trying to get into the bear cage as well what other animals do they have let's just ch check this out again he tells us what they have peacocks three ostriches raccoon a bear a crocodile and an opossum among others 
So it's possible that they have another animal. Rob says, my theory, it's some other zoo animal. Okay. Uh, that's certainly possible. And it was trying to get into the bear's cage or the bear was trying to get out and attack it. What other animal could cause an attack on a dog? I guess there are some. All right. So let's, as this is like a game of uh, intuitions, who thinks that it was a, that there was a real knife? So this is the only thing I'm asking you to vote on. Today's session, you're just going to guess whether you think that the doctor was right, that it was a knife that injured him, or was it an animal attack? So just vote, get on the record whether you think it was a knife attack or an animal attack. I think it was an animal attack. Um, okay, let's see. Nicholas says it's a knife. Rob says animal attack. Wow, three people think knife. Debbie, Nicola, and Antina, you trust the, uh, four people think it was a knife attack. You trust the vet, huh? You trust that the vet will know the difference. Five people say knife. Hmm. Well, this is going to be interesting to see if your instincts are right. That the vet, notice he didn't quiz him. He didn't say, are you sure it's a knife? The guy just assumed it's a knife. I mean, that could know, but you know, a knife is just a very sharp wound. You, you, especially back in 1920s, uh, it's not like a gunshot where you can see a bullet. You know, when you say a knife, you just mean a sharp cut. So I'm not sure a vet could be expected to know for sure that it was a knife. He'd probably just uh, didn't. Who's going to think you're living in a place with bears? All right. Well, there's the votes. That was our first session. I hope you found it interesting. I'll see you next week, hopefully, for session two. Any last comments on the case, on anything interesting? Most animals would leave a single wound. They'd be multiple claw marks. Yeah. Yeah, but um, if it was running away, you could see how you could get one big claw in a flank. I have a very hard time imagining Forget about the motive of a human trying to stab a dog with a knife. But that's that would be very hard to do. All right, let's end it there. I'll see you next week for our next letter. Hopefully it'll come in time. If I get them fast enough, we'll play them on Sundays. Otherwise, we'll have to... Play it by ear, but we're not committed to Sunday. If you think you'd rather play these at night, uh, we can work that out. Let me know. There's a forum for this channel, the Board Game Geek Guild for Co-op for Two channel. You can find a link to that on the About page of this YouTube channel. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can post if you watch this after we play it, not live. We some comments on this video, what you think about the case, what you think about the system. So far, I am very intrigued. I'm looking forward to the next letter. I'll see you next time.